I solved the other problem I hadn't considered. So far I only solved the problem of where does energy come from, where does free energy come from? It comes from the same place that energy comes from because there's no difference between the two. It comes from one quarter of the AC cycle that an electrical engineers avoid and ignore and some don't even think exists. The quadrant concerning negative unity power factor. But that's only one fourth of the AC cycle. It turns out one half the half that I've been, of the two quarters that I've been avoiding, namely the zero power factor, that's where energy disappears to. And it doesn't disappear. It becomes imaginary. That's what Eric Dollard has been saying all along. It goes into counter space. What, it, what is counter space according to Eric? It's the field of the complex numbers. You know, both the real and the imaginary. The imaginary, of course, being the square root of negative one, and the complex being the union between the real and the imaginary. But it, it's sufficient union of imaginary with the real that it makes the energy useless. And what do we call that? We call that unstressing in TM. Because what is pain? Pain is very real energy. I've lost my son, and it's something I can't lose because I'm devoted to him. And my brother started the process. He got rid of my son from me, and as a happy-go-lucky meditator, I did nothing to stop him. And as a forgiving brother, I kept forgiving him. So he ran with that mileage that I gave him and destroyed my life because it was my ex-girlfriend, the mother of my son, who beat me up and beat some reality into me that she was in pain. And I'm still devoted to her, and so I'm devoted to the pain that she shared with me. There were boxing matches, but still it was so disruptive that I ended up hating myself, and so now I hate myself. I have no self-respect. And there's no way I want to transcend during meditation, because <laughs> I have no self-respect. I don't let go. Well, the letting go process turns energy that is real, but painful, into a confusion of energy that is not real, that is imaginary. And th thus, when real energy, such as negative unity power factor or positive unity power factor, turns into imaginary energy, such as negative zero power factor, there being two quadrants of that on the AC cycle, what it means is Mother Nature has literally given herself, at the very least, <laughs> if not me, given herself four opportunities for processing and managing energy. One is to use it, that's the po positive unity factor. Another one is to synthesize it, that's the negative unity power factor. And two quarters is to lose it, but you don't lose it. It simply becomes useless. And that's the negative zero power factor. Now what did Maharishi say about stress, when, or what did he say about unstressing during meditation? Somebody asked him, well, where does the stress go? I think they were rounding. And he, and he asked them, okay, we have stress, which is very real, the pain that we experience is not imaginary, it's very real, but it impacts us in all the wrong ways. But once we release that pain or stress during meditation, where does it go? It goes to the universe, but what form it does it take? Nobody asked that question. Well, now I've answered the question that Eric Dollard answered, but it didn't it didn't click for me until now because I've defined it in my own terms. The decomposition of electricity back into its constituent ingredients doesn't defy the law of conservation of energy because the energy is still there. It's just that the electric field and the magnetic field are no longer in sync. And this is what he talked about when they laid the telegraph ta cable, the transatlantic, and, and Oliver he Heaviside solved the problem of why the energy was falling apart by the time it got to the other end. They got no clean, crisp signal. They got a mess because the magnetic field traveling down the wire never made it, while the electric field did. So he created 
coax in which the core was copper surrounded by insulation, surrounded by an iron ribbon or an iron wire wrapped around it, surrounded by more insulation. So the iron wire served as the cage, the coax, what the equivalent of today's coax cage, that the shell, the metallic shell, that it's a mesh that travels down the outside of the wire, so it's two conductive paths. But if it's made out of steel or iron that's magnetizable, you've literally got the means by which, a waveguide, by which now that becomes magnetized while the copper core becomes electrified and both fields, the magnetic and the electric, travel down the wire and they come out the other end a clean, crisp signal without the need for repeating stations along the way. Because the telegraph line, let's say in 1850, they had boosting stations actually, not well, repeating in the sense that the energy is repeated, it's boosted. Every about 150 miles, more or less, give or take, they have a galvanic pile, an earth battery, buried in the earth. They were disks of zinc and iron alternating with gravel in between, and so they had a battery, a dry cell battery, to boost the signal every 150 or so miles. But they got away with it because it was land-based um, telegraph uh, transmission lines. Once they had to lay the line across the Atlantic Ocean, and the only solution up to that point was, well, let's beef up the voltage on the sending side, using brute force to get the signal across, all that did was increase the electric field. It did nothing to help the magnetic field. Although it was helping it in a minor way, but only in a minor way because the magnetic field dissipated so rapidly, it didn't help. And Oliver Heaviside, being a mathematician, solved the problem by looking at it as a mathematical problem instead of a theological problem, which is what they were doing, beefing up the voltage. They believed in their, belie in their theory, not knowing whether or not the theory would work, actually. They just believed in it blindly. But Oliver Heaviside went at it as a mathematical problem, which is the way Steinmetz worked. And that's why he was able to become the first electrical engineer, because he solved everything mathematically. But, but he got the credit. And that's why we call him the father of electrical engineering. We don't call Oliver Heaviside the father of electrical engineering because nobody believed him. He painted his toenails pink and took all the furniture out of his house and slept on rocks because he became despondent and crazy, crazed over the fact that nobody believed him. The Royal Society of London called him a quack or a crank or something. But he actually solved the problem and got the job done, and so now we had a telegraph system that worked across the Atlantic without the need for a boosting station every 150 miles. It boosted itself, all on its own, just because it was constructed properly, the cable, the telegraph cable. So this took care of the decomposition of electricity, and now I know what the decomposition of electricity means. It goes into the complex field. It's still there. The energy's still there. It didn't disappear. Conservation of energy has not been um, violated. The only problem we have is that there is no, there's a hole in our laws of thermodynamics. We have, I think, three or four of them. Just like we have three or four categories of perpetual motion machines, we have a, about the same number of, as it turns out, no direct correlation, but it's interesting, there's about the same number of laws of thermodynamics, but there's one missing. Because the laws of thermodynamics, all of them have to do with loss by way of conversion. There is no law of thermodynamics having to do with the production of energy, the synthesis of energy, from the composition of the magnetic field and the electric field in a framework of time. We don't have that. And this is how we make electricity, according to Eric Dollard, but we don't have it in our laws of thermodynamics. So there's nothing wrong with the conservation of energy law because the energy is still there. It's just been disassociated so that the waves of the electric field and the waves exhibiting current and the waves of, excuse me, ex exhibiting voltage and the waves of the magnetic field exhibiting current don't match up. Well, they're not 180 degrees out of phase, but they're not a zero degrees in phase. They're 90 degrees out of phase. And there's two opportunities for that in the, um, in the, qu in the AC cycle, either the current gets ahead of the voltage by 90 degrees or the, or the voltage gets 
ahead, or the current gets behind the voltage, or the voltage gets behind the current. So it sounds like four opportunities, but in reality it's only two because those four break down into two groups of two each in which either you use a capacitor or an inductor to shift. Um, well actually, that's not four. There's only two. That's right. Capacitors can only do one thing. They always shift the current. Excuse me. They always shift the voltage ahead of the current by 90 degrees, while the inductor always lags the voltage behind the current by 90 degrees because of back EMF, the resistance of the coil. Meanwhile, the capacitor is inverted. The mathematical formula for creating a current source when calculating current for a capacitor is the reciprocal, the mathematical reciprocal of the same equation for the coil. And by reciprocal, I mean one over, one divided by. So, whoops, sorry, <laughs> dropped my uh, camera here. So, um, there's only two opportunities for creating um, this shift by 90 degrees. But if we do both, that's when we get 180. Because one wave is moving forward in time by a quarter cycle of an AC cycle, while the other wave component is moving backwards and it can go either way. So there's actually two opportunities for that as well. So it's just that they're both done at the same time though. So either the current moves ahead by one quarter cycle and the voltage moves backwards in time by a quarter cycle. Oh no, there's only one opportunity. Oh, they just simply do both do it at the same time. Okay. So either the co so both the, the coil lags causes the voltage to lag by 90 degrees, and if a capacitor causes the voltage to move ahead, but... No, that's a contradiction. Wait a minute. Oh dear. Oh, so there are two sets of waves that are canceling each other out. But the energy is still there. The current is moving... Am I saying that right? No, 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 no. There's only one opportunity. Yeah, the uh, capacitors can only do one thing, and one thing only. They can move the voltage ahead and the current back. Meanwhile, the coils can move the current ahead and the voltage back. So actually there are. There's two sets of waves that cancel each other but it's each but the the two components of each wave have to cancel the the uh the two components of the other wave so there are four components of two waves and it's the two electrical components the the capacitor and the coil that manages to accomplish this both at the same, but they both have to do it at the same time. So there's no other way to do it. You have to have four components of two waves of electricity operated upon by two electrical components, the coil and the capacitor, to create this cancellation of two electric waves, two sets of two components each of two electrical waves to become canceled at the same time. There's no other way to do it. So even though there's only one opportunity of one quarter of a AC cycle, it's really being done to two waves of electricity at the same time. The four components coming in two sets of two, electri of two waves of electricity at the same time. The problem with the zero power factor is that it only happens one or the other. Either we have a coil taking the energy and turning it into the imaginary or complex field, I'm not sure which, making it useless, or the capacitor does it. But either one or the other, but not both. Um, for a wire, it's the magnetic field that lags behind and is separated by the current 
uh, no, excuse me, it's the current that lags behind the voltage by 90 degrees, and that's contributed by a coil or a wire. A very long wire is equivalent to a coil, while a capacitor, which is equivalent to the insulation on a wire for that matter, a capacitor causes, um, what does it do? It causes the current to lag behind the voltage. No way, it's the same thing. Huh? No, it causes the voltage to jump ahead of the current. Well, that's true, each component can only do one thing, so it's really not two, elect two waves of electricity, it's still only one. It's either they work together or they work separately. If they work separately, then we destroy energy. But if they work together, we create new energy. That's what, really what it is. But this is how energy gets destroyed so that the pain that we experience of the stress of, in our lives has two separate opportunities for being destroyed, either inductively or capacitively. So we have an inductive process, an inductive function of current lagging voltage by 90 degrees, or we have a capacitive function of voltage leaping ahead of current by 90 degrees. Either way, we can unstress the energy because now the energy is useless. It's, and it stays useless, and it goes out into the universe. It leaves because it can't be associated with a waveguide anymore, and our body, our physiology, is that waveguide. So it, it leaves our circ the circuitry of our body because it's no, it can no longer be associated with any circuitry. It's impossible. It's lost forever. Well, not forever, so long as the universe remains active. And once it goes into pralaya, at the end of its the day of Brahma, the day of Brahma lasts 2.2 quadrillion years, and we're close to the noon of, of the day of this current day of Brahma, in which the mantra of this day is Om. It signifies this day. But the last day of the of the creator of Brahma was signified by the mantra Gong. <laughs> that that comes that knowledge comes courtesy of Tatwala Baba, uh, a dear friend of Maharishi, um, another yogi. Uh, um, so uh, the universe will deal with that stress and get rid of it somehow, just like we get rid of it at night when we sleep. But it goes to the universe when we sl sleep or when we meditate. The universe has to get rid of it, and she takes it and puts it back in the absolute where it came from in the first place, by some mechanism, God knows how. All we know is how to disassociate the electric field from the magnetic field so we never violate the conservation of energy. She can violate it all she wants to because she's in charge. But we cannot because we're not in charge. That's why the law of conservation is there, to signify that we're not in charge of the destruction or the creation of energy, but she is. Actually, though, let's take a moment and pause here, because the one quarter of the cycle of AC, we can't be creating energy, right? Yet somehow, we're pulling apart the electric field from the magnetic field by 180 degrees. But we start with usable energy, so we can't do anything with the stress. That we have to leave alone. All stress is going to do during the day cycle of creation is build up. It can't get any better. It'll keep getting worse. And that's why pralaya has to occur, because the whole system runs down due to the stress build up, building up in the system of the universe. See, we have distinct grooves or slots for the dielectric lines of force to, f to fall into in space. And they're not all filled. And so we have this quanta, which is the groove, and each one is a potential for the dielectric force to run along that groove and become actualized as kinetic. But it's that's because 
the dielectric has choices which groove within space to travel along. Well, what if all the grooves were filled? Then energy would come to a standstill. It wouldn't be able to move around anymore. We wouldn't have change. And, ver and the universe would have to go into a state of virtual existence, namely sleep, namely pralaya, to get rid of the, all the energy in all the grooves. Well, at least the ones that don't twist around. See, the ones that twist, when you have two lines of dielectric force twisting around each other, a quarter turn, create like a twine, you know, when you wrap twine around a package, it creates a quarter turn. That um, creates matter and mass, and that's structure. So there, and then we get the electromagnetic field in orbit around the intersection. So now we have both the electric field and the magnetic field in association with each other. So how can we have the magnetic field disassociated? I guess it's wherever the lines of dielectric force do not cross and meet. Then the magnetic field, that's it. That's why it's complex. Because the dielectric lines of force always is real. That's the only reality, is that are the dielectric lines of force. The, the, um, the electromagnetic is always imaginary when the two dielectric lines of force are disassociated from each other. They don't cross. The magnetism goes imaginary. It's still there. It's just not, it doesn't have an intersection to go into orbit around and, and become real, become a real number quantity. So when all the dielectric lines of force lose their ability, that means we lose all matter and everything turns into energy. And that's a fully stressed universe. Maybe it's a game of musical chairs. Because I can't see, the way the Vedas describe it is whatever does not go into the Absolute during Pralaya comes back out again and picks up where it le left off in its evolutionary track. That means that there's more energy in the system than there are slots to lay out all the dielectric lines of force without any of them crossing. So that means when they cross, they economize and double up. That means that it liberate when two lines of dielectric force or the electric you know an electric field cross in space they're combining it's like two lovers move you know one moves in with the other to live in the same apartment or whatever so it's like two dielectric lines of force are using only one groove one quanta to occupy by the way of occupying uh, this, that space by two quanta of energy. So, because there's not enough grooves in space, quanta grooves, potential, there's not enough potential lines of dielectric force in space, namely the grooves, empty slots, to be filled by all the dielectric lines of force when they're spread out and, and not intersecting, not interacting with each other. There's not enough. So we'll always have matter. But there's not enough for enough of that matter to disassociate into dielectrical lines of force that are not associated with each other anymore. And so the magnetism goes imaginary, but not all of it because there's not enough room. It's like the game of musical chairs. So when it reaches that point of disassociation, which is an automatic, spontaneous process over time, energy disassociates, dielectrical lines of force un un unravel with each other causing the magnetic field to become imaginary. When that fully occupies all the potential grooves in space, all the potential quanta, because a quanta is not a unit of measurement, it's a location in space. It's a potential groove or slot for a dielectrical line of force to run down. And either it's there in actuality, creating a kinetic dielectrical line of force, or it's not. It's a potential for dielectrical force. but there's not enough potential lines of force to be uh, come occupied by actual 
kinetic lines of force of dielectric. And when all the potentials are occupied by the, the kinetic, speaking of the dielectric, m many of whom, well, we don't know the proportional relationship between the two, so some of whom are disassociated from other dielectric lines of force, so they are stress, basically, because the magnetic field, the electromagnetic field is imaginary and the dielectric is real but not interacting with other dielectricals create a pair, at least a pair. <laughs> See, that might be um, it could be that the dielectrical lines of force can create multiple entanglements, just like the neurons in our brain. But it can become untangled, and that must be the falling apart of our brain in old age, senility. So when it falls apart to the extent that it can, that the universe allows it to, up to a boundary point, that's the end of the day of creation, and then it goes into sleep to somehow reverse the process. Why not? So that's when time actually does go backwards. All the stress leaves its disassociated condition and goes back and becomes integrated with all the other stress, namely all of the, the other kinetic dielectric lines of force that are disassociated from each other. They all gravitate and become associated, so the whole universe becomes fully integrated. Amazing. It's like a clock winding down and then it gets wound back up again. Why not? Why shouldn't time turn around and go in reverse? We already do that when we create negative unity power factor, but it's done equally in opposite directions, so we're not really doing anything to time. The current um, moves backwards by a quarter cycle of the AC cycle, and the voltage moves forward by a quarter cycle, and so the difference between the two is a difference of one half of an AC cycle, and so we, we we're able then to synthesize electricity from, yeah, from where? Well, we use positive unity power factor to create more positive to create more positive unity power factor that means we're so we're like a vacuum cleaner we're soaking so we're actually doing the universe a service by cleaning up the stress that's in the universe collecting it and turning it into useful energy how about that we're doing mother nature's job for her on her behalf and what thanks do we get from the rest of humanity who believes that free energy doesn't exist, we get persecuted. <laughs> Oliver Heaviside was persecuted, and all he was doing was preventing the loss of a uh, positive unity power factor. He wasn't synthesizing it, he was just preventing its loss. But in my circuit I simulation, I actually engineer or design, theoretically, but mathematically correct, according to the lo th uh, laws of electrodynamics, the uh, synthesis of electricity from its constituent ingredients of disassociated electricity, namely the stress that's, that's out there in the universe that's not associated with any matter. The imaginary component of electromagnetic field and the real component of the dielectric field, because the dielectric can never go imaginary. It's always real for eternity. It, it's the one stable factor of the universe is the, the potential for capacitive reactants to dominate. But it's never appreciated because it's sometimes in a mixed state with uh, condition with uh, electromagnetic energy. Um, positive unity factor, or it's in a disassociated state for half of the AC cycle when it's zero power factor. Anywho, I think I've covered, now I completely understand the synthesis and decomposition of electricity, I think. <laughs> it, se it seems like it. Wow, that is amazing. 
Now, do I share this with anyone, I wonder? Normally, I sit down and I share, but I don't know. I didn't have to do this. But, you know, I was wondering about how I'm going to deal with my stress. And the only way to deal with the pain of losing Kyle is to die. So that my body becomes disassociated, all the energy will become disassociated and go out into the universe. Um, and I'll get to start over fresh without any memory of pain. Because I was born sickly, so I don't allow myself to become senile. I, I can't afford to. Because along with, in, 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 in parallel with that, I would become sickly. And I was born sickly, so I, I've done everything I can to prevent senility indirectly by preventing poor health. I have all these protocols that I know about and I engage in them and so it keeps me healthy and vibrant but it also keeps me in constant pain because of my devotion to my son and the separation occurring simultaneously. It's been um, nine years of separation well, ten if you include his fetal development, because I was, we connected before he was born. That's what makes it utterly painful. So it's ten years, and that's how long it takes to become a meditator as a guy. You know, I'm a guy, so it takes ten years for the physiology to become, the nervous system to become fully developed. Nine years for a woman, and ten years for a, a boy. <laughs> Nine years for a girl, and ten years for a boy. So now I'm, I've reached the maturity of my pain. And I fully understand electricity, how it's synthesized and decomposed. How about that? Except I have no way to do anything about it. I create this free energy book that nobody will appreciate unless I die. And then they'll appreciate it. I'll be martyred. And then everybody will be running around naked because they'll realize, oh yeah, he created this book on free energy, but he's also a nudist. And that's when society will fall apart in about two or three years whether I die in two and three years or it takes two and three years for the, uh, for it to reach the majority opinion and spread around by uh, word of mouth, I don't know. But, um, in any case, it'll take probably a few hundred years for people to appreciate free energy, but they'll appreciate nudity. That is the language that the common person can understand. And that's why I pursued it for most of my, for all of my adult life, and and most of my child, and half of my childhood, or some of it anyway. I didn't pursue it when I was fasting, but on fruits and vegetables. But I don't have the. I, I'm too cranky. I'm too vindictive. I'm too resentful to fast or do anything to release myself. I don't even like unstressing. I'm so resentful to unstress. I'm just angry. I'm so angry. I just hold on to the uh, pain. I, I can't let go. Yet my intellect can let go, but not my heart. And the heart is the only thing that matters. My intellect has figured out free energy, how to do that in a circuit, but <laughs> how do I induce that in myself and, and allow myself to do it? I don't. I've got two techniques. I can either fast or I can meditate. And either way, I will release myself from, from the pain. And I don't do either, because I'm resentful on both counts. I'm just resentful, period, that I have the pain to such a degree of resentment that I don't even, that I'm also resentful to let go of it. So we, I'm stuck with it. I'm so smart, you know, smarty pants, intellect, but I'm so dumb when it comes to my heart. And I'll have to be born in my next body dumb. Or maybe I'll just be transferred to my son's body and not have to go through the process of death because I don't deserve to pay for what has happened to me. So I won't have to pay. I won't go through the d process of death. I'll just get transferred. I'll fully remembering, remembering of what has happened, but I'll probably keep it to myself and not tell anyone. That's probably what will happen. I'm guessing. Because I wasn't supposed, to, Charlie Luce said, I'm supposed to become spiritual in this lifetime. So how can, if he said I'm supposed to, and that's the law, you know, whatever Charlie says is the law. Well, how do I get around, what is, what would, what um, avenue 
of approach would Mother Nature allow for in order for me to get away with dying unenlightened would be to transfer to my son's body. So not only did he, the, the, his birth create the pain, but he also created the potential for me, an outlet for me to deal with the pain the only way my karma allows me to do. Because as Gandhi, I fasted myself to oblivion so, uh, to the point that I, at which I reached the seventh heaven in my interstay between the two lifespans. And the seventh heaven is the, is the experience of enlightenment. If it's experienced by somebody who comes back as a woman, she has to put off being coming enlightened. It's not automatic, but for a guy, it's automatic. Yet here I am, and I'm not enlightened. I'm acting like a girl. In, dis in which I gave birth to Kyle. I was preparing. I was doing all the preparatory work while my ex-girlfriend was going to work and shouldering the actual physical burden. I was the one shouldering the psychological burden of giving birth to him. I was reading all the natural health, natural childbirth books, and I was going to raise him because I knew she wasn't going to do the work, and she couldn't. She, was, she felt, feels she's incompetent, so she was never going to be his mother. I was going to be his mother. So I did all the preparatory work, and so I suffered all the loss. So I've literally taken on the persona of a woman, and instead of allowing, being allowed to work it out through the course of his lifespan, and be done with it, I can't. I'm holding on to it as a, a unfulfilled mother who never, who lost her child at birth, and I can't go back and have another girlfriend and, and start all over again because I'm in too much pain over the last one. So I can't go through the vicarious process of giving birth all over again to a second child. I'm incapable of it. I've been totally in incapacitated. And legally, within the county of Los Angeles, I'm not allowed to become a parent again. But psychologically, <laughs> I take it around with me wherever I go. And, not, <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, my record follows me wherever I go, from state to state. I found this out. It's used against me, even though there's no legal justification outside the jurisdiction of federal territory. But... Uh, <laughs> Anybody can do that and, and uh, make me feel like uh, I take my karma with me wherever I go. So psychologically, I'm convinced that I've lost my right as a, to be a parent in any state of the union. So I figure, what the hell, you know? I'm not going to go to a foreign country and live. Maybe I should. And then I could start all over again. That seems to be the only outlet. But will I be healthy or will I become sickly again? Will I have Amazon to support me <laughs> when I can, where I can buy whatever supplement I need very easily in the States? Can I do that outside the States? Well, Amazon is... I know the reach that Amazon, because I've published in outside countries, it's distributed, so I know the reach. Um, not India. Amazon doesn't reach India, but... Uh, or Russia, for that matter. No, wait a minute. Does it reach India? I think it does reach India. It doesn't reach Russia, though. But it reaches Germany and not Russia. That means it reaches my father's side of my family, not my mother's side. Wouldn't you know it? This is a female pain that I have. And it was my father who contributed to our diet before I was born of a raw food vegan diet, which gave me the weakness that I have because we were. my mother was also an alcoholic at the same time as being a raw food vegan. So I have congenital defects that are that plague me that I was born with, but my father got away with it because he wasn't an alcoholic. He smoked a pipe, so he wasn't an alcoholic, and he was oblivious to the fact that the rest of the family was an alcoholic, along with everybody in the family fasting on fruits and vegetables, except for my brother who pigged out on uh, hot dogs and hamburgers whenever he got the chance, <laughs> and he was usually persecuted for it by being sent to bed without his dinner. Not that he wanted to eat his dinner anyway. <laughs> he would have preferred something else. Oh, boy. And, he, and he's the one who's, who's ungrateful for what his father did to him. So uh, he, he smushes the grapefruit half in my face like uh, Jimmy Cagney did it in that famous scene of the movie. 
to, uh, was it Gene Harlow? Or was it somebody else? I forget who he did it to. Oh, well. He was having marital squabbles with his girlfriend at the table, at the breakfast table. <laughs> <coughs> tough Jimmy Cagney. Okay.